Hi, welcome everyone to this week's Future of Storytelling virtual roundtable conversation. We're very excited to have Jonah Sachs here with us today, uh, the author of Winning the Story Wars and the uh, creative force and founder of Free Range Studios. Jonah is one of the uh, incredibly talented fellows behind some of the best um, uh, online sort of viral videos of our day. Many of you have seen, <clears throat> excuse me, the story of stuff and the Matrix. Jonah, we're so delighted to have you here with us today. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me, Charlie. Great to have you. So um, we're also joined by a number of other people, and I thought we'd kind of go from the right to the left and ask everyone to just quickly introduce themselves. Uh, Rachel, why don't you start? Okay, I think maybe we should start from the other side. <laughs> Um, Ari, why don't you start and introduce yourself, please. I'm Ari Kushner, the CEO and executive producer of Missing Pieces, um, creative commercial production company. Great to have you with us. Eric. Great. Oh. I'm next. Hi. Uh, my name's <laughs> Hi, my name's Eric Fabian. I'm the director of brand and PR for Molsk in America. Welcome, Eric. Nancy, are you with us? Yes, I think so. Am I? Yes, you are. Yes, okay. Uh, Nancy Green, designer in New York uh, and storyteller. Welcome, Nancy. Hey, Rachel. Rachel Shepman. Uh, I'm the founder of Story, a new concept. It's a physical space that reinvents itself every four to eight weeks, like a living magazine called Story. Great to have you all here. Um, so. As you know, the Future Storytelling uh, Summit last October was organized around this idea of roundtable conversations. And so we're incredibly excited to be able to recreate that experience virtually, uh, powered by our friends at Google+. Um, so, so Jonah, um, I was a big fan, or I am a big fan, of this book of yours. And in here, you talk a tremendous amount about the role that mythology plays uh, or should play in marketing today. And I was wondering if you could share with us just a little bit of your philosophy about the role of marketing in the uh, post-broadcast era. Sure. sure. Yeah, I mean, I, when I was thinking about, when I was writing the book, thinking a lot about storytelling and stories that matter, um, I immediately started asking myself, what kind of stories actually influence and shift behavior? Because it's really not enough for marketers to go out there and get people interested in clicking on a story, viewing the story, maybe passing it along. As marketers, we really need to get people to start building their identities and changing their behavior around the stories that they hear and tell. And so um, I asked myself, you know, what kind of stories have always done that? And that's what led me to this adventure into the world of myth. Because every society that we know of has been built on myths. I kind of say myths are like cultural DNA. They tell a society what's important, what matters, who we are. And the best storytellers in the marketing world have sort of done that. They've made their brands things that people connect with on that level of, oh yeah, this is part of who I am. So in the old days of the broadcast era, there were certain stories that would be told that would get people to move to action and really push people towards a sort of consumerism. There was an inadequacy myth that went out there that told people, without this brand or service, uh, you don't have enough. And the brand becomes like the hero of that myth. I think what's happening now in this post-broadcast era, though, is we're starting to see the best marketers breaking through by creating new sort of legends and myths that put the audience as the hero of those stories. I know you talked about that role of um, hero and mentor, uh, mm -hmm. and I had never really thought about that. Uh, I know it's very inspired by Joseph Campbell's work, uh, but talk, talk to us a little bit about that. What, am I a hero? Am I a mentor as a consumer? <laughs> You're both. Um, you, uh, the, I kind of came across J Joseph Campbell because I had made these two spoofs about seven years ago. One was a spoof on The Matrix called The Matrix about factory farming, and one was a spoof on Star Wars called Grocery Store Wars. And both of these stories were just you know, silly food, food activism stories, and as soon as I put them out there, I was getting tens of millions of views on them, and I was like, these stories are amazing, they really work. And why do people respond to these stories so much? And of course, if you try to compare The Matrix and Star Wars, you come across the work of Joseph Campbell, who massively influenced both of those movies. In fact, 
helped to write Star Wars. <clears throat> and his concept of this, the myths and stories that have worked across all times and all cultures, he calls the hero's journey. And that story is, you know, the, the, the story of an outsider um, kind of muddling through a broken world who then meets this incredible mentor character, someone who creates a really personal relationship with that, that hero to be. So this is Obi Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker. It's the good way, uh, the fairy godmother and Cinderella, or the good witch and Dorothy, or God and Moses. And this mentor tells the character, you can connect more deeply to your values. You can go on this amazing adventure and change the world. And what Campbell said is that the stories that people have always cared about and shared are, are not about heroes who get rich and famous, but heroes who can heal a broken world. And so I think that in this, um, that marketers can really understand that human beings have always responded to these kinds of stories. And there's a couple insights from them. One is that the hero is never the knight in shining armor to begin with, who kind of has mastered the world. The hero is the outsider who feels kind of hopeless and disconnected from their values. So when talking about your brand, you are not the outsider, you're the insider. So that means you should not be the hero of your own story if you want to follow this hero's journey model. But recognize that that sort of jaded outsider who maybe is kind of stuck is, is the hero, and that's going to be your audience. So if you're not the hero, that gives you a chance to play that mentor character, to be that deeply personally connected person who said so much more is possible. Let me talk to you on the level of values. Let me connect you to those values. And let me introduce you to a magic world of this brand that can allow you to contribute something more to society. And if you follow that pattern, you'll find not only some of the most beloved brands of all time, although they're, they're not the majority, but the ones that do it tend to be the most iconic, but also stories that are really social media ready. Because instead of banging your own chest and touting how great you are, you help people see how great they can be and become an evangelist for your brand. You know, I, just hearing you say that, it, it makes me think about the Moleskin brand, Eric. I mean, it, if, if there's ever been a brand that provides a, a mentorship and offers a magical gift to its, to its uh, customers, uh, the Moleskin Journal seems to me to be one that really does that beautifully. Do you, do you ever think about that role? I mean, are you, are you guys conscious of this in your marketing? Well, you know, we don't necessarily use that language when, in, in, in how we talk about it, but I could see, um, you know, in, in thinking about, um, you know, a kind of mythology and, you know, the roles of kind of certain kind of totems, you know, whether it's a special sword or some sort of potion or something like that, how, um, you know, an object can really be a transforming uh, tool for people as they go off on some sort of hero's journey. And we think of ourselves certainly as somebody who um, provides platforms or tools uh, for people to create and express themselves and to organize their lives and to share their imagination. So definitely we, you know, in no way really try to shape the story of our, our fans' experience, but definitely we want to provide tools where they can really write their own story and write and create their own hero's journey. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great example of what I you know what I call empowerment marketing, which is not producing a set of tools that says sit back, let us take care of the things for you. This will make life easier for you. This will solve your problems. But say here's a tool of transformation. Here's a tool that you can use to express yourself. Here's a tool that you can use to reach your higher self. And you know self expression is a you know one of those higher values that stories have always spoken to. So that's a really good example, I think of the kind of marketing that's much more likely to travel these days than the kind that just says, let us do the creativity for you. Yeah, it's much more empowering to the, to the consumer. Um, Jonah, talk to us a little bit about, about some of those negative, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the term you use, but when marketers basically try to make consumers feel uneasy or uh, self-doubt, what, yeah, what so are some of those bad examples? You know, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, marketers were out there just kind of pushing the facts and the figures of their, of their products. And, you know, that sort of worked for a while, but the space got kind of crowded. And they started looking towards how can we tell stories that are really going to make people, move people to action, not, by, not with the facts, but with stories that we tell. And the first ones that they started experimenting with were based on this sort of Freudian worldview, that there were only a few universal human driving values, like fear, greed, need to fit in. Um, status and so they started specifically designing in, in academic journals and then in actual ads they produced 
ads that would make people that would that would touch those sort of lower values, make people feel insecure. So one of the most famous is that Listerine ad that came out in the 1930s about this 30-year-old woman who was still a spinster and she would never be married because she had bad breath. And her name was Sad Edna. That was like she was incredibly famous. People wanted to like know her story more deeply. And a product that had just been a dental antiseptic became the beginning of the whole new beauty industry because people were terrified. And the story went, you know, you will be a victim of society if you don't engage with this brand. It was a threat and a thinly veiled threat. Um, and so that was the kind of marketing we saw so much of. And then it started to sort of meld to be things like this product will magically make you uh, give you status. So all the Cadillac advertising of the 1950s, that the, this, this Cadillac will show, well, it's the only way to show what, what a man you are. And now more recently, it's morphed again into this kind of joking thing like we see with the, the Whopper freakout videos, for instance, that were, that were popular where people come into a Burger King and they order a Whopper and they're told the Whopper doesn't exist anymore. And they melt down, they cry and they scream and they like trash the store and the security video showing that to these you know, supposed adults without their favorite products, they become like helpless infants again. So the moral of the story of all this inadequacy in marketing is basically like, you're nothing without our product. And it's a language that doesn't actually really make any sense or isn't really true, but we all speak it so intuitively. And it's hard to sort of break that cycle of we are the hero and you are the damsel in distress audience. But that's the inadequacy, inadequacy approach. And I think it's been very powerful in that broadcast era, getting people to believe that without their favorite brands, they really don't have an identity. But um, it's much harder to use when you're asking people to partner with you and pass those messages to the social networks. Because asking people to threaten their social networks is not a, the way people build social capital anymore. It's, it's kind of the opposite now, right? You want to build up and empower your friends, not make them feel shitty about themselves. I'm, I'm curious, Jonah, where you think um, we are in that curve, you know? Because I, I think about that often. And, you know, there's times when you see a great campaign or you see, um, um, you know, something really amazing out there. Um, I think you talk about like make it count and yes we can and you know certain positive things that have but but overall it still feels like we're we're in early days of yeah. of that switch and so I'm curious where you think in your study of the of the timeline where you think we are I think we're at uh, we're kind of at a burgeoning awareness phase at first when I started doing the research I thought that this kind of marketing was only appropriate in the post-broadcast era, that if you look back at the broadcast era, you would only find inadequacy marketing. But what I found really amazing when I started to test that hypothesis was that a very small percent, let's say about 5% of ads, took the anti-inadequacy approach back in the broadcast era. But if you looked at the ones that were using it, you would recognize all of them, like, you know, Apple and Nike and Obama, the, you know, first time, the first time around with Obama. and. Um, you know, like the Dove Real Beauty campaign, the ones that sort of reach this sort of first level of iconic resonance often would use that empowerment approach, but it was a tiny minority of the, of the brands out there. Most were still telling you, let us make your life simpler, more convenient, let us take care of you. The ones that were calling people to higher purpose um, were definitely out there, but the, the vast minority. I think now there's a lot, you see a lot more thinking, a lot more writing, and a lot more attempts in the post-broadcast era to do this right. Um, but I think a lot of people still, it's still the vast minority, and I think a lot of people are afraid of trying to empower their audiences because they feel that it takes away the chance for humor, it takes away the chance uh, for irreverence, it takes away the chance for uh, kind of shorthanding things. It's all got to be yes we can, it's all got to be uplifting, it's all got to be earnest and emotional, and I think that's really not true at all. I think that uh, you know, there's still tons of room for humor without making fun of your audiences. And there's still tons of room for adventure without like making it look like a sort of nonprofit thing just because you are creating uplift for your audience. I think just the first shift is, you know, let's stop being the hero of the story. Let's talk about what it means to our audiences to be the hero. And let's, you know, partner with them. Because if you're not partnering with, with them in the communications, in the way that you communicate, you're unlikely to be able to partner with them to spread the message. And nowadays, getting your audiences to spread your message is, you know, the price of admission for staying in business. Because if you can't, no one's going to listen to you. So it's early days. I think maybe at one point, you know, we'll see empowerment marketing start to be as prominent as inadequacy marketing. I don't think, you know, there's no point in having every single ad out there following the same formula. But I think there's a huge amount of running room to claim that space still for anyone who wants to try. 
I just wanted to jump in and say that if anybody um, wants to share a question who's watching us uh, through the internet, through Google Plus or YouTube, feel free to uh, text that in and we'll, we'll post it up to, to Jonah. I'm sorry, Rachel, I think I was interrupted you. Oops. I think we've lost Rachel. <laughs> nope, she's there. Okay. Um, so, Joan, talk, talk to us a little bit about the role that technology plays now, the changing technology landscape. Uh, how, how do you see some of the new tools really be, being employed successfully? Yeah, so um, the whole idea of storytelling for marketers used to boil down to this idea that you would do your insight work and then the output would essentially be a, a canned set of stories, right? So you've got your 30 second ad that you've put out, maybe there's a minute long version of it, there's the print ads that support it and go with it, and that's your work for the quarter or maybe even for the year, and that's the story that you choose to tell, and then you try to refresh it the next year. Um, and that is very much broadcast tradition. Now, of course, if we look at what the oral tradition was like, you know, all, all the way back in before the broadcast tradition took over, stories worked much differently. You'd, you'd tell them, but then someone else would repeat it, and then it would change, and it would morph, and you'd get feedback on the story, and went to the next campfire, you might tell it a little bit differently. And that's much more than what we're seeing right now, where a story is not something that you make and put out in the world and then expect applause on. A story is something that you define a sort of world, a position and a sort of the world that you want to create, the characters you want to create in that world, and then you put it out there on multiple channels sort of as, as a conversation. You set the sort of tone of the conversation, but then you allow the conversation to, um, to happen out in the crowd. And, and, and get feedback and continue to evolve it. Um, so, you know, you see things like the obvious uh, stuff that's ha that happened with the Super Bowl. Um, this is not empowerment marketing per se, but, you know, Doritos really well defining what their brand world is, so much so that they can have their audiences designing the advertisements for them, and not just getting funny ads, but getting things that are really on message for that Doritos brand, better, better, better probably than, uh, you know, an, an advertising firm would have created for them. Um, uh, there's the work that Jeff Gomez is doing in New York City I think is fascinating where he's producing basically show Bibles like you would for a sitcom for a brand so here are all the characters who live in your world here are their character arcs here are the the settings and places we can go and it's almost like a Dungeons and Dragons world he's creating so the marketer then has created an entire magic world to produce a series of tweets Facebook posts uh, alternate reality games and really what they're doing, like you, would with a, like you would with a television show, you're developing it over serially. You kind of know where it's going, but you haven't written it out until you see it out in the wilds. You know where you want the characters to go and change and move. So I think that, um, yeah, what we're seeing really now is the work is not just getting that camera set in just the right way, but it's how do you create that strategy? What, how is my brand itself an unfolding story? And how can I, over time, continue to tell pieces of that story in exciting and new ways? And, um, you know, that's obviously not easy to tackle. Our organizations are not set up. Our brands are not set up to do that. We need new kinds of people, new way of thinking about everything, um, much faster, more iterative approaches. Um, but that's, I think, where the best brands are going. It certainly seems that there's some danger involved, too, right? You're, you're basically setting up a story world with your brand and then letting the consumer kind of live it out and tell it. Uh, and Is, I know that there's some risk. At, uh, some of the big companies are really scared of that. It's also opportunistic because you know you're you're really integrating current events. You know what's going on in the world into your brand. You know you're really moving out into the real world where messy things happen. And um, it's interesting to think about brand management in that context. Whatever brand management means these days. Yeah, um, you know, to that to that risk point for sure. You know, yes, it's a risk to put your story out to the crowd, but I'd say your story's out in the crowd anyway, right? Like, what, what are, before people would consume advertisements and they would not, they might, you know, wave their fist in disgust at it, but they wouldn't be able to contact anyone else to talk about it. Now, when you put something out there, everyone who has something to say about it is going to find everyone else who wants to hear about it. So, whether or not you're canning something and putting it out to the crowd or letting the crowd participate in it, you're, you're opening yourself up to that interpretation. And to that point, uh, Nancy, that you just made about, about keeping up with current events, being opportunistic, that is obviously a way of getting a huge amount. It's a, it's a, it's a huge way of getting a huge amount of buzz. The funny story that I often tell um, is about you know, how, that, how that can go wrong as well. You know, when Kenneth Cole tweeted about the Arab Spring and said, you know, millions in uproar in Cairo, they must have heard our new spring line is out, um, available online. 
that's an example of getting a lot of buzz because you're tapping into to a, a social media moment and current events, but not the kind of buzz you'd want, of course, because people were, you know, horrified by that tweet and he had to, you know, back off and apologize. And so, you know, understanding what you stand for, what your story is, is a, a kind of a plus, uh, is, is, a, is a price of admission before even stepping into trying to get involved in current events because just throwing funny things out there can be a real disaster. I think the uh, the Oreo thing is a good example too, right? Talking about the Super Bowl. I mean, the 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 fact that it's so talked about is just because they can actually get it done within mm -hmm. you know the span of a conversation. And um, and I don't know if it sort of totally fits into the the sort of Campbell thing we're exploring, but it definitely shows a a sort of where where they where brands could go in interesting ways where they react to conversations um, in real time and are empowered by the moment, by the situation and empower people um, through the through um, social media in that case. Well, yeah. you, you, you talked earlier about, you alluded to values and principles. I'm not sure you actually said those words, but when you start thinking about people being the voice of a brand and many people being the voice of a brand, then values and principles and culture of the brand become very important. And you know it works against this kind of culture where, where people move around a lot, and they're not really very invested in cultures anymore, in a specific culture. So you want to speak to that for a minute? Yeah. Definitely. So you have transience versus you know a deep understanding. Do you mean transience in audience or transience in in culture of the internal brand, the, working at the brand itself? Both. I think there's a transience within company, a transitory yeah. um, uh, culture within a company, and then there are, of course, the customers who are coming and going. So, you have sort of very basic, important ideas yeah, working yeah. against a lot of movement. I I agree, um, and I think I'm glad you asked the question about values because it's it's at the it's at the heart of stories. First of all, so let's like use a storytelling model to talk about values for a second, and then how this relates to kind of building an internal culture and what it means for audiences. Story itself is, you know, is a, is a simple uh, human communication tool, and what what it looks like is a sort of it's got a surface, and on the surface of the story, you have all the act, the actions, the characters, the plot, the conflict, anything that you can see. You go to a movie and you talk about what you've just seen. You're talking about the surface of the story, and then you know, most storytellers, we all know that that those characters are not just thrown there because you had an idea to put that character there and oh, let's put that plot there and see if it works and then move it around. You do it in a strategic way. You put those things there to illustrate a sort of truth about how the world works, which is you know, what I call the moral of the story. And that's the core truth that should resonate with audiences and make them learn something as well. Now those morals of the story um, are the second layer. But the third layer, and the reason that stories are so important, the reason that cultures are built on stories, the reason that kids ask for stories every five minutes from their parents, because those, those lessons are based on values. And the stories um, that we put out there and the morals, the worldviews we put out there are really ways that humans can replicate their values and share them with other people and illustrate what those values are in the real world. So if you take any character in a story, you should be able to identify what values that character holds and then their destiny illustrates what happens to people who hold those values like mm -hmm. greed or um, altruism, et cetera. So really stories are values replication tools. and. Um, and so we can't really tell stories, I don't think, effectively over time as a brand until we understand those values on which our stories are based. And those values, if we're not just talking about ourselves but our audiences, need to be values that connect with our audiences. So then the question is, if you know, okay, are we values based? And that doesn't just mean we're the greenest brand or we're the we give the most to charity. But right. you know, in the case of Moleskin, you know, clearly one of those values is is creativity or self expression. Mm -hmm. So if we stand for those values and we're telling stories about those values. How do we organize everything within our organization and our brand around those values? That's the real win, I believe, is to be able to tell authentic stories and actually use it as an organizing tool. So if everybody at your company knows that one of your core values that you're communicating to your audience is self-expression, how does the workspace and the corporate structure and all that play into that, feed into self-expression? How is the story told internally, not just the founding story of the brand, but how do these values get passed on internally so that we're living them out in every moment? Then all you have to do is turn on a camera in your office, and you've got a great 30 seconds, you know, mm -hmm. a little web video to show how everyone at Moleskin is doing self-expression on, you know, in their off time or whatever, however you want to pull it off. So I believe that without values, this whole thing is totally hollow and empty anyway. And who cares about you know what the greatest next greatest marketing tool is? Um, but if we think about stories as containers for values and living those values out as the ultimate win then actually the storytelling model doesn't just work for your customers, but works for your entire team and focusing everything that you do. 
So, so, so your biggest job as a company is to make sure not that your marketing messages get out, but that your values are well understood by everyone in your company. I, I think that's the long-term win, definitely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. We, and I, you know, and one thing I find, I think, when we uh, at, at Moleskin, when we were thinking about um, uh, communicating our values. And <laughs> Oops. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll pick that thought up in a minute <laughs> when Eric comes back in. Um, uh, hey. Both values in the sense of the brand and also. Uh, Company values um, is that you know we go out of place and we are buying stuff. I lost you. So I'm not sure if they can hear me. You're we back, can, Eric. Am I back? We can okay. hear you, Eric. All I was I was just trying to express my agreement and uh, and say that the you know in the in the marketplace I think that you know it, it becomes less about trying to sell. Um, some sort of thing, an object to people, as much as just go about that process of sharing your values and offering people uh, access to those values. A partner, you know, a kind of partner who shares your values, uh, and part of that relationship happens through, you know, the purchasing of objects, but then also through a variety of other kind of a uh, kind of activities. Um, I w I wonder though, Jonah, it seems that some some. Brands, some some products that um, some companies make are more uh, uh, kind of suitable to this kind of empowerment um, message than others. Like we had the good fortune of starting with a with a notebook, which obviously is uh, is is a tool. You can blank. You know, people can add a lot of themselves to it. But I wonder if you you see that there's other kinds of um, uh, kind of products out there that where the challenge is bigger, and maybe how would you go about kind of approaching that to help them kind of use this kind of strategy? Yeah. So um, you know, one example of a product that you know I think most of us would agree is not a um, doesn't have a huge halo around it uh, as a product itself, but it to be able to do a values-based brand would be something like Ben and Jerry's, right? So the the product is kind of a guilt food. It's not something we should be consuming too much of, of course, and yet they focus so relentlessly on values and the values that maybe they were, you know, they were able to live those values out through their product in some ways, like where they sourced their ingredients, uh, the farmers they worked with. Um, they couldn't get the sugar and the fat out of their food. It's still kind of, you know, it's a junk food. But they were able to both source more values base, but also really use their platform to express their very personal values. And, um, you know, it, there was a lot of factors in Ben & Jerry's success, but one thing about being so values based um, is what created that sort of peer-to-peer -peer buzz that built the brand from a little, you know, Vermont ice cream shop into something much bigger. So it's not, you know, they didn't have the sort of easy, you know, softball approach, but they really use that as a, um, they use that as a as a challenge. How do we, working with what we've got, um, you know, really go and uh, go and, and and become more values based? I, I did a little exercise for myself in the book about, around Listerine, which is this very much inadequacy-based brand because, as I said, you know, uh, 80 years ago, they started telling everybody, you're going to be unloved if you don't use our product. And, you know, how do they evolve? How would they become more empowerment-based? And so I just did a little thought experiment for the book, and I said, well, what if they, you know, what if the message was that, you know, Listerine is all really about closeness between people? It's not about, uh, you know, being accepted, but it's about, you know, we, we believe in people being close. And, you know, the, the implied piece of this is, you know, it's good to have good breath when you're close. But really, what if they looked at how can we bring people together? How can we create marketing that's all about bringing unlikely people together, bringing community together, um, <coughs> connecting lonely older people with uh, people in the neighborhood who they you know who have some time on their hands? All these programs that they could be running that would be buzzworthy and also imply the benefit of the product. So I think that no matter where your product is at, unless you know you're making you know, weapons of mass destruction, you can really, you know, use these, some of these ideas to not only develop uh, better marketing, but and then to Nancy's point, to ask yourself, well, how can, how can we actually operate more, um, more altruistically internally as well, and how can our marketing actually drive us forward to be a more um, sustainable or values-based brand? So I think there's a positive, there's kind of a positive feedback loop, and I say in the book, you know, this is a hero's journey for marketers to think about this stuff, because the marketer themselves can become the hero of the organization, making it far more values-based because the story leads the way. Yeah, I, I would... I, I, also I would, think, Oh, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry. 
Well, no, a couple things I was just going to say to chime in that I think is both adjacent and an extensive to the extension of this conversation is is adding into the mix, um, you know, clarity. Um, like how how clear and relevant are your values to what your story and your business is? Like, does it make sense? And then, you know, I find authenticity is a word that's been so abused over the last two years. But kind of the practice, what you preach, right? So, like, perfect example. And and like Ben and Jerry's, I feel like Tom's shoes is one that's used quite often. You know, one for one, you give away a pair of shoes for every pair you sell. But then you have Skechers come out, same same value proposition they want to offer, one for one. And we're going to call it Bob's. And for every pair of Bob's we sell, we'll give away a pair to a child in need. And guess what happened? You know, thousands and thousands and thousands of people just, like, called them out and said, you know, forget not buying Bob's. We're never going to buy Skechers again. And so I think, like, one thing Ben and Jerry's did, did great about is the same way they were talking to consumers in terms of, creating programs for women and and the environment and all these other programs, they were practicing what they preach by, you know, buying cane sugar in countries where there's not tracking under, under methods that they didn't have to do, that they were doing, so that they could behave as a company under the same values. Mm -hmm. And I just think, even if it's not sexy or altruistic, if you're clear with your value, you know, Square's value proposition was empowering the individual and the small business owner to take payments. And, and it was about access, right, and, and empowerment, right, positive. So I, ju I just think it's important to, to think of both clarity and authenticity as part of this bigger conversation. Yeah. And I would add just um, this idea, uh, there's a project, uh, there's a recent project by Google called Project Rebrief where they take an old famous campaign and they bring back the sort of creative person behind it and they like adapt it for, for what it would be now. And you see really interesting uh, connections with a lot of the stuff that um, we're talking about, Jonah, and a lot of the sort of Ben and Jerry's is a good example. But even like the Volvo one, there's one about Volvo and they get the guy that came up with Drive It Like You Hate It, which was a very infamous, you know, uh, print ad from uh, print ad and uh, TV commercial from the 60s, I think. And when he comes back and they start plotting what it should, what the campaign should be now, they find a guy who's been, who's driven, who has a million and a half miles on his Volvo from the 60s. And that beca he becomes the anchor of the story. So it's interesting to even see how, like, when you rebrief it to now, you inst you, th there's a desire to go in this direction that I think um, uh, complements a lot of the research and, and theories in, in your book and sort of where, you're, where your head's at. Yeah, definitely, and that and that bridges really nicely to this question that's coming in online about you know how do you is it just fictitious stories we're talking about? We're we talking about real stories too, and you know Ari, you're pointing out a place where um, they first touch base with like what is you know with the rebrief thing there they're, they're touching base like what is our the story we've been telling and trying to tell, and then how, before going out and trying to find a compelling, interesting story they want to tell, they try to connect it to what they stood for and what their story was all about. Then they went out and found the guy who had a million miles on his Volvo. So they're not telling a fictitious story, but they're telling a story that's very aligned with their overall story strategy. And so I think what we want to do when we tell truthful stories, as you know, any journalist knows, is a, you know, there's a million ways to tell a story. There's not a true story and an untrue story. There are stories based in reality and stories that are fantasy. When we tell a story based in reality, we still have to make a ton of choices, right? We still have to decide, you know, what um, who the hero of the story is going to be, how that hero, what what details of that hero's life do we want to do? We want to cast to create identification between us and our between that character and the audience. Um, what values does that hero stand for, and what does the hero learn through the story that we tell? Um, who what what creates the the change in the uh, from the starting state to the end state. All of those choices that you make and how to tell that story can be aligned with your values and your story strategy and, and your archetype as a brand. Are we telling this story with great humor? Are we telling this story uh, as, a, as a kind of like emotional call to action? So even if what you're only doing is going out there and documenting something that really happened, the angle that you take, who you highlight, how you highlight them, how you tell that story and with what tone, it should all be based on the larger brand and story strategy. Yeah, and, and for real stuff, it should be said that, especially with video um, storytelling, like there's two kinds. There's the internal and external kind of thing. So the internal is more like what GE was doing with GE Works, where it's like 
um, you know, it's a response, obviously, to the economic climate and to, but it's also a way to say, you know, here's our people and here's what they think and here's what they're doing and working on. And that's like internal company uh, manifesto to the outside world. And then there's the kind of like external where the brand is associating itself with an interesting thing, which we see a lot of and it's a lot of the kind of work that we do as well, where it's like, um, like Intel's visual life, where it's like the brief is just like, find really interesting people that are living, um, you know, very visual lives. And it's a very open thing, but you find these characters that are, you know, really special and, and, and create this aura around the brand that associates itself um, with. So when we talk about real versus fiction, I think those two, those two distinctions come to mind, at least in the kind of work that we do, when it's real, when it's docu. Yeah. Or docu-reality. I mean, a lot of the times it's like what I call sculpted reality. <laughs> right. So it's, it's very, that's a whole other conversation about what is what. Is what. Yeah. Well, that's a, I'm, I'm afraid that our time is up for today. We, we're trying to keep these sort of strictly to 45 minutes. Uh, but I look forward to continuing these ongoing conversations about how stories are changing uh, in, our, in our digital age. Um, Jonah, I wanted to thank you for being both a, a mentor and a hero uh, for, uh, to me personally, um, and all the rest of you for joining us today, and hope you'll come back and, and be part of our ongoing future storytelling conversations. So thank you all so much for being here Thanks today. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks. Nice.